Now, the question is, can we legislate morality? Yes? OK. Let's take a break. <laughs> I'd like to start in the United States Senate. Way back in 2003, this is Senator Sam Brownback. He's now the governor of Kansas. He was the senator from Kansas back then. And uh, he showed a photograph of a 21-week-old baby in the womb who was spared abortion by doctors who operated in the womb to correct a birth defect. And this is a, a picture. You can see the hand gripping the finger of the doctor. Here actually is a better shot of that. This is in the womb at 21 weeks. So he showed this photo. And he asked the question, is little Samuel's hand the hand of a person? Because that was the name of the baby. Sam, it's ironic that's Sam Brownback's name. Uh, or he said, it's just, just, just a piece of property. And Senator Barbara Boxer, I think, if I'm not mistaken, she's from California. <laughs> she said this. I am not a doctor and I'm not, a, I'm not God. I trust other human beings to make these decisions. Question, do you need to be a doctor or God to know that that is a human being in there? And by the way, if she trusts others to make those decisions, she should not be a lawmaker. Because that's what lawmakers do. They make decisions like that. So maybe she should just get out of the Senate. I, I would think that would be the, the way to handle this. All right, so let's, uh, let's talk about this whole topic. Here's what we're going to do. The first thing we're going to talk about is should Christians be involved in politics? Secondly, can we legislate morality? Why would we in, be involved in politics at all? Can we even legislate morality? You always hear you can't. Thirdly, what are the stakes of being involved or not being involved? And then finally, what can you do? That's kind of the big picture. You guys ready to go? Yeah. All right, good. Point number one, should Christians be involved in politics? And when people say to me, particularly Christians, they say to me, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not involved in politics. I just preach the gospel. In fact, Pastor Jack has had many pastors that he's tried to reach out to to get involved. They'll say, look, look, brother, 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 I just preached the word. Okay. Whenever I hear something like that, I take out my iPhone and I show the people who say this kind of thing this picture. Does anyone know what this is? This is Korea. This is the Korean Peninsula. Now, why is there a difference between South Korea and North Korea? And don't say electricity. Okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's part of it here. South Korea is one of the most Christianized countries in the world. It has the gospel. It has freedom. It has, obviously, a very robust economy. North Korea, on the other hand, is a concentration camp. There's one major reason for the difference between South and North Korea. Anyone know what it is? No, it's not God. I hate to say it, it's not God. But actually, I mean, God remotely so, yes. Obviously, there's a big difference that God, there is God in South Korea in terms of uh, the ability to preach the gospel, and in North Korea you don't have that, but it's more basic than even that. The major, well, freedom, but what's the broader category? The broader category is politics. The South has freedom, the North does not. Can we do what we're doing in this room in North Korea? No, we can't. Why? Because politically they ruled it out. And when... Pastors or Christians say, I don't get involved in politics because I just preach the gospel. I say to them, then you don't think the gospel is very important. Why? Because in places like South or like North Korea or some of the places I've been to, like Iran, Saudi Arabia, and China, you can't do what we're doing legally in this room, what we're doing right now. We, we, we can't do this in those countries. Why? Because politically they've ruled it out. Politics even affects our ability to preach the gospel. 
And in fact, just, just go to North Korea and try and do what we're doing. Just go to Saudi Arabia and try and do what we're doing. Just, tr just go to Iran and try and do what we're doing right now in those countries. You can't do it because politically they've ruled it out. In fact, if you think about this long enough, you'll realize that politics affects almost every aspect of your life. Politics affects your church, your family, your health, your money, your business, your freedom, your property, your school, your home, your security, your safety, the poor, the unborn, just about everything. Politics even affects this building and how it was built here and what the code is for the building. Politics affects virtually everything that you do. So if you don't think politics are important, you basically don't think life is important. In fact, what do you always hear? There's two things you never talk about in polite company, religion or politics. Well, those are about the only two things worth talking about half the time, if you think about it. How are we going to live now? That's politics. And how are we going to live in eternity? That's religion. So those, I mean, those, that's a lie from Satan. Don't talk about those things. Those are the two things that are really are worth talking about. Now, what is the purpose of government? What is? What, why do we even have a government? The Bible actually tells us why we have a government. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 13. He says the government is the servant of God to execute wrath on the wrongdoer. The main purpose of government is to protect innocent people from evil. That's the main purpose. If there was no government, we would not be protected from evil. What do you think would happen if uh, law enforcement said, tomorrow... There will be no law enforcement. You can do whatever you want. You'll never be prosecuted for it. What do you think would happen? There would be mayhem. People would be killed. People would be raped. Best Buy would be overrun. You think Black Friday's bad. <laughs> Car dealerships would be overrun. You think people are inherently good? No. We're inherently evil. It's easy to be bad it's hard to be good that's why james madison who said one of the most pithy things ever about government and who is the father of our constitution said this if men were angels no government would be necessary if men were angels no government would be necessary we need a government to protect innocent people from evil you say well jesus didn't get involved in politics au contraire we talked about this last night in fact in the book of Matthew, Jesus actually excoriates the politicians. Here's what he says. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dull, and cumin, but you have what? Neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. He says this to the political leaders. Now, if he were here today, he would say the same thing to our political leaders. You know, our political leaders are telling us what light bulbs we can't and can't use, but they won't prevent people from murdering people in the womb. Planned Parenthood is selling body parts. And they're trying to justify this. And you know what the politicians are saying? Well, maybe we ought to defund Planned Parenthood. Maybe we ought to prosecute Planned Parenthood. How about that? defund them. Gee, maybe we ought to defund Hitler for the concentration camps. Maybe we ought to prosecute them. What are the more important matters of the law? Jesus says justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Do you think killing people is a more important matter than what light bulbs we use? Yeah, we've got everything inverted in this country. And you'll see a little bit later whose fault that is. Now, have Christians failed? You know, there's a lot of people who say, well, look, we tried to get involved in politics, and, you know, just nothing ever works out. I mean, we're losing everything. How can you be involved? I want to take a macro view. I want to go all the way back to, uh, to the first century right up to today. Outside of these few things, we have failed in politics, completely failed. Outside of getting rid of slavery, kidnap brides, child labor, gladiatorial combat, death games, infanticide, child marriage, temple prostitution, child sexual abuse, child prostitution, wives as property, fair treatment of prisoners, equality of mankind, and even restricting abortion. We haven't done anything good politically. Take the macro view. We've actually done some very good things to civilize society as Christians. Even on the issue of abortion, since the Supreme Court legislated from the bench, is it continually seems to do now, we've actually made some advances on the issue of abortion in this country. Over the past decade or so, pro-life Christians have passed over 500 laws restricting abortion. Moreover, the abortion rate has declined about 22%, and we're now a pro-life country. Just barely, but we are. 
And sonograms have helped do that, helped show that. But even if we were never successful on any political endeavor, it is not your responsibility or my responsibility to win politically. It is our responsibility to be faithful. It is our responsibility to do what, what's right and leave the results to God. Because even just by going through the struggle, Jeff was just talking about life is a conflict. Going through the conflict, going through the struggle actually enhances us and helps us to become more like Jesus. So we suffer for Jesus even if we don't win politically. Now we win ultimately in the end. But the point here is, is we're supposed to do what's right and leave the results to God. So I don't care how bleak anything looks. I don't care how many times you failed in the past. It's not your role or your job to guarantee a victory. You can't guarantee a victory in a temporal sense. Your job is to be faithful and leave the results to God. So you keep doing what's right no matter what happens. Does that make sense? All right. So... Now let's go to the next question, can we legislate morality? Because you always hear you can't legislate morality. And I want to start with my favorite politician from the Commonwealth, uh, the People's Republic of Taxachusetts, John Kerry. Okay? And here is what John Kerry said when he was running for president about 10 years ago. He said, I oppose abortion personally. I don't like abortion. I believe that life does begin at conception, but I can't take my Catholic belief, my article of faith, and legislate it on a Protestant or Jew or an atheist. We have separation of church and state in the United States of America. Now, for some people, that just sounds so reasonable, doesn't it? But this, I submit to you, is a fallacy. There are several fallacies in this particular quotation here. And as Chesterton, Chesterton said so well many years ago, he said, fallacies do not cease being fallacies when they become fashions. There's a lot of fashionable statements out there that sound really good, but they're still fallacies. Now, why is this particular statement from John Kerry a fallacy? Well, let's take a look at some of the things he said here. I believe life does begin at conception. Well, uh, Senator Kerry, it doesn't matter what you believe about it. It's true regardless of whether you believe about it. It's not just your article of faith. It's a scientific fact that one, when a, a, a sperm and an... Oh, did I say sperm? You're not supposed to say that. A soldier <laughs> and an egg come together, you have a 100% genetic human being. That's, that's, not, that's not an article of faith. That's a scientific fact. And also the separation of church and state. What does that have to do with it? You'll see it has absolutely nothing to do with it here in just a second. Let me ask you this. Suppose Senator Kerry had actually said this. Suppose he had said, I oppose slavery personally. I don't like slavery. I believe blacks really are people. But I can't take my Catholic belief, my article of faith, and legislate it on a Protestant Jew or atheist. We have separation of church and state in the United States of America. Would you go, what would you say? That's just stupid, man. Well, it is stupid. Because none of this makes any sense when you look at it for more than 10 seconds. Because the separation of church and state is irrelevant. Whether or not it's in the Constitution, it's not. But it's completely irrelevant. Why? Because the separation of church and state is not the issue. The issue is not religion, but morality. We got to keep, this is, a, this is the key distinction I want you to get in this entire presentation. When you're talking to somebody about these moral issues, you're not just talking about religion. You see, religion has to do with our duty to God. Morality has to do with our duty to one another. We are not trying to tell people where, when, how, or if to go to church. That's legislating religion. But we can't avoid telling people how we ought to treat one another, and that's legislating morality. And here's the news flash of the day. All laws legislate morality. Every law declares one behavior right and the opposite behavior wrong. You can't think of a law that doesn't legislate some sort of moral principle. Yeah, well, there are some laws that you might consider, well, they're not really moral, like, you know, how many representatives are in the United States uh, Congress. Okay, that might not be a moral law, but it, what the moral aspect of it is, whatever we decide, that's what everybody needs to obey. Okay? Even speed limits imply a moral right to life. Why are there speed limits? Because we think life is valuable. And we think it's immoral for you to put other people in danger or yourself by going too fast on certain roads. Speed limits imply a moral right to life. Now notice, the First Amendment to the United States Constitution actually says what? Can anyone tell me what it says? What's that? Freedom of religion. Okay, well, the freedom of religion. Does anyone have the real language? 
Can anybody tell me what the real language is? To the First Amendment, the United States Constitution, no Google. What's that? Congress shall make no law. I said no Google. The guy's reading it off his phone. All right, throw this guy out of here. <laughs> See, this is the problem. We don't even know what it says. It says Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Notice, by the way, the uh, First Amendment does not say Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of morality. Or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Why? Because it's impossible. In fact, this particular amendment establishes a moral code. It says it's immoral for Congress to establish a national religion or prohibit the free exercise of religion. That's a, that's a moral claim it's making. It's putting morality into the law. That's what all laws do. You say, well, Frank, we can't legislate the Bible... Why not? Would that be immoral? But do we, when we legislate laws against murder, theft, fraud, these kind of things, are we legislating the Bible? Well, in a certain sense you could say yes, but actually in another sense you could say no. Why? Because you don't need the Bible to know that murder and theft and fraud are wrong. They're written on your hearts. In fact, if somebody says we can't legislate anything that's in the Bible... What would that mean? We could have no laws against murder. We could have no laws against theft. We could have no laws against fraud. We could have none of these laws. Think about that. In fact, if we couldn't have laws consistent with the moral principles in the Bible, we couldn't have any of these laws, including laws against murder, theft, and rape. So the point here is, is we're not legislating religion, but we are legislating morality. Just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean we can't legislate it. But the Bible and the moral law upon which this nation was founded come from the same source, God. Amen. That's why when Jefferson said we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men were evolved, oh no, created, <laughs> and endowed with their creator with certain inalienable rights among these life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. You know, I had a debate with Michael Shermer a few months back in New York, and I brought up this. And he's an atheist. And he said, uh, he lives out here in California. He said, uh, oh, well, well, the founders meant evolved. They didn't mean endowed by creator. I said, you are out of your mind. <laughs> That's just stupid. We're endowed by our creator. If there is no creator, as I said last night, there are no rights. No rights to anything. Because everything's just a matter of human opinion. All right. So obviously, yes, the answer is you can legislate morality. By the way, morality is legislated on all these things on both sides. Pro-life people think an unborn child has a moral right to life. Pro-abortion people think, oh no, a woman has a moral right to abort her child. Those are both moral claims. Same-sex marriage. I have a right to same-sex marriage. I, I have a right not to endorse same-sex marriage. They're both moral rights. Same thing is true with no-fault divorce. By the way, where did that start? Does anyone know? By who? By Ronald Reagan. <gasps> the patron saint of conservatism? Yes. He, <laughs> he later regretted it, but he, he signed it here in California and it swept across the nation. And by the way, we got to get a lot more serious about that one. Absolutely. As Christians, we've got to start making it more difficult to get a divorce, not less difficult. Do you know the only so-called contract that we have in America, that the party who wants to break the contract is given favor, is divorce. Think about that. Any other contract? You have a business contract and you want to get out of it? Oh, the other guy has a contract. You're going to have to pay up. No. In marriage, you can just say, look, I don't like you anymore. I'm out of here. I'm not happy anymore. By the way, is that... Is that the standard that we go by if you're not happy anymore you, you, you have a right not to be married where do we get that from where do we get that idea that happiness is our standard and if we're not happy no longer do we have to 
adhere to our vows. Where do, where do we get that from? By the way, is the goal of marriage just to be happy? Is that it? Gary Thomas wrote a book years ago. It was called uh, Sacred Marriage. And the subtitle is all you need to know. The subtitle said this. What if God created marriage more for our holiness than our happiness? Because by having to sacrifice for somebody else, you become more like Jesus. If it's all about you and marriage, it's not going to work anyway. Happiness. That's up and down. That's a feeling. As Rodney Dangerfield said, my wife and I were happy for 20 years. And then we met. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I'm very happy with my wife. Right, dear? No, I am. But look, if happiness is our standard, everyone in this room is, who's married, you'd have been divorced a thousand times. Because there are times you're happy and there's times you're not. It's not about happiness, it's about holiness. And it's about committing yourself to somebody else. In fact, a friend of mine who is a pastor in Charlotte said, where do we get this idea that feelings, love is all about feelings. He said, let me tell you what love is. My mother lost her mind to Alzheimer's. My father, for years, took care of her every day, even though she didn't know who he was. That's love. It's not just about feelings. Uh, what about some other objections about you can't legislate morality? Like, what about prohibition? We cover this in the book, Legislating Morality. But just because you can over-legislate morality doesn't mean you can't legislate morality. In fact, the people who are against prohibition have a moral category. They say they have a moral right to manufacture and drink alcoholic beverages, where people on the other side are saying, no, you don't. Those are both moral categories. Morality is legislated either way. Uh, what about this? You always hear this. You can't make people be good. Well, most laws aren't trying to make you be good. Most laws are trying to prevent you from doing evil. As Martin Luther King said, it is true the law can't help make somebody love me, but it can help them from lynch lynching me, and I think that's pretty important. <laughs> of course, tragically, the law didn't even help him completely because there are people that break the law and murder others. But the point here is, is that laws aren't intended to make you be good. Laws are intended to prevent you from doing evil in most cases. And what about this? You hear this all the time. You shouldn't impose your morality on other people. If somebody ever says this, you shouldn't impose your moral views on others, what question should you ask him? Apply the claim to itself, like we did last night. What would you say to somebody who says this? Yeah, simply say, hey, is that your moral view? Notice this is a self-defeating statement because they are imposing their morality that you'd not impose your morality on them. It's a moral point of view. You can't get away from it. And by the way, when people say this, I may say this to them, but then I'll say, look, look. This isn't my morality. I didn't make it up. I didn't make up the fact that murder is wrong, that abortion is wrong, that men were made for women and women were made for men, and that when they come together, they procreate to perpetuate and stabilize society. I didn't make that up. That's not my morality. That's just the morality. If you've got a problem with that, you've got a problem with the creator. You've got a problem with me. I didn't make any of this stuff up. And so when people say, don't impose your morality on me, I go, look, it's not my morality. And I don't think you ought to impose my morality. And I don't think we ought to impose your morality. What I think we ought to impose is the morality. The one that Thomas Jefferson said was self-evident, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident. These are self-evident truths. By the way, why did Jefferson put life first? Because the right to life is the right to all other rights. If you don't have life, you don't have anything. So the point here is, is just say, look, it's not my morality. It's the morality, and you know it in your heart. You may suppress it. You may want to do your own thing. And if you're going to try and tell me some other moral uh, statement is true, you've got to give some evidence for that. Who, what's your standard? Who said abortion is a moral right? Who said two men marrying one another is a moral right? Where do you get that from? If there's no standard beyond you, it's just your opinion. It's not a right at all. All right. So, of course, you can legislate morality. Now the question is, what are the stakes? What are the stakes of getting involved or not getting involved? Well, actually, there's some very severe stakes going on. The stakes are very high. Here are just three of them. Your children and grandchildren are going to be affected dramatically 
by how well you get involved in the political world. Secondly, your freedoms, including your freedom to preach and live the gospel, are going to be affected. They already are going to be effective. And finally, just lives in general are going to be saved or not saved by what we do. And uh, let me start by pointing this out. Let me ask you guys a question. Can anyone tell me who this is? That's Britney Spears. Here's our problem. Everyone goes, oh, yeah, that's Britney Spears. What's the First Amendment of the Constitution? I don't know. What? Yeah, see, that's our problem right there. Everyone knows that's Britney Spears, but we don't know the Constitution. Yeah, that's Britney Spears. Now, Britney Spears got into a lot of trouble several years ago because of this. What's the problem? No seatbelt. The baby is not restrained in a safety harness, a baby restraint system. She is a moral monster. Now, I don't know about you, but if you go back 40 or so years... Nobody thought this was a moral problem. <laughs> In fact, my dad used to put me on his lap and we'd steer through town. In fact, Bruce Springsteen has a song where the, he said my dad would put me on my lap and we'd steer through town. Asbury Park, New Jersey, right where I'm from. And people would do this all the time. And you remember, you folks were old enough to remember the Woodside Station Wagon, right? You'd go on vacation. Mom and dad would sit in the front. All the kids would get in the back and you'd be crawling all over that car. You wouldn't be strapped down at all, right? And every once in a while, Dad would have to turn around as you're crawling all over the back. You kids better knock it off, or I'm going to come back there and knock a few heads together, right? Nobody's buckled in. You're going 70 miles down the highway, and no one ever said a word. Today, if you don't strap your kids in like they're about to take off on the space shuttle, <laughs> you're somehow some moral monster. How does this happen? What happened? What changed? We saw too many kids in accidents get injured or maimed or killed, and we said, we need to put a law on. We, you know, you're going to have to strap these kids down. And now we think that anybody who does this kind of thing is somehow a moral monster. Because the law changed. Why? And here's the key point. The law is a great teacher. Many people think whatever is legal is moral and whatever is illegal is immoral. We see this with slavery. About 150 or so years ago, about half the country thought it was okay and the other half said, no, nope, this is immoral. Now... How many people do you know who think slavery, the kind of slavery we had 150 years ago, is a good thing? Hardly anybody. Question, are we more religious now or less religious now? We're less religious now, yet we have a better moral view on slavery. Why? What changed? The law changed. The 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, after a horrific civil war, said that you can't do this anymore. Slavery is now illegal. And many people think whatever is legal is moral and whatever is illegal is immoral. Abortion, same thing. In 1973, we had a consensus around the country, 50 state laws against abortion. Then, seven justices in black robes, unelected, overturned the will of the people in all 50 states in Roe v. Wade. Now we're about evenly split on abortion. Why? Because many people think whatever is legal is moral and whatever is illegal is immoral. Now the same-sex marriage case, same thing. What kind of implications is that going to have? We're going to talk about it tomorrow morning in the first service. But the point here is the law is a great teacher. If you don't get involved, what you're saying to your kids and grandkids is that the law that will help teach them what they think about right and wrong doesn't really matter. And we're not doing anybody any favors by saying that it's a good thing that you get into a relationship with somebody of the same sex and try and stay in, stay in that relationship. Because medically, it's a dangerous thing. And yet, now what, that's what the law is saying. The law just isn't permitting this. The law is promoting this now. See, the law is a great teacher. We'll see tomorrow morning the difference between permitting something and promoting something. So, the law is important. You can't give up on the law. Now, also, the gospel is affected. These two politicians, who shall remain unnamed, <laughs> according to Gil, one of them thinks he's God, 
Hey, in all seriousness, we need to pray for our leaders. I don't care who's in there. You need to pray for them. But President Obama and, both, uh, and uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton have shifted their language in recent years from freedom of religion to freedom of worship. Have you noticed this? Because there's a big, big difference. The First Amendment of the United States Constitution says that the Congress or the government can't prevent the free exercise of religion. Notice that? The free exercise of religion. Freedom of worship is something a lot less robust. Freedom of worship is to come in here and, and sing songs and think about Jesus or think about Jesus in your home personal life, but that's as far as it goes. You can't actually live it out. So what these politicians are now seem to be saying is that you can believe anything you want while you're in your church, but you can't act on it outside your church. Or we could put it this way. Your pastor can preach whatever he wants as long as you don't obey it. That's, pastor Jack, can, he can talk about anything he wants up here. But just don't you dare go outside these doors and try and apply it. That's the difference between freedom of, of worship and freedom of religion. In fact, this is what Justice Kennedy said, who, by the way, I think is from... California, <laughs> Sacramento, who was appointed by Ronald Reagan. Oh, I love Reagan. <laughs> we all make mistakes. This guy was the substitute for Justice Robert Bork. I'm telling you, if Bork had made the court, this country would be in a lot better shape right now. But Justice Kennedy, who in my opinion, I'm not saying he's an evil man, but he is literally the worst justice in the history of the United States because he doesn't pay any attention to the United States Constitution. He's a legislature, a legislator, he's not a judge. Here's what he says, however, in the second to last paragraph of this decision. This is the same-sex marriage decision. He says, finally, it must be emphasized that religions... And those who adhere to religious doctrines may continue to advocate with utmost sincere conviction that by divine precepts, same-sex marriage should not be condoned. Notice the language here. You can advocate whatever you want. But notice he doesn't say that you can continue to live by those convictions. You can just talk about them. You can preach about them. But don't you dare try and live by them. This is not freedom of religion. This is freedom of worship. In fact, this is Kai Feldbaum, who was a lesbian activist appointed by President Obama, talking about the inevitable conflict between so-called gay rights and religious rights. And here's what she says about the whole thing. I'm having a hard time coming up with any case in which religious liberty should win. In fact, have you heard of these folks? Aaron and Melissa Klein said, we cannot participate in a same-sex wedding by providing a same-sex wedding cake for you, right? Well, do you, know what, do you know what happened to them recently? It's in the state of Oregon. The state of Oregon and their labor commission, whoever it was, has fined them $135,000. $135,000 for pain and emotional suffering. To the two lesbians, they politely said, oh, we can't do your... Same-sex wedding. Now, let me ask you a question. Whether you're, you consider yourself homosexual or heterosexual, would you want anyone who didn't agree with your marriage to have anything to do with it? I mean, is it so hard to find somebody else to bake a cake? Or another florist? Or another photographer? No, then why are these people so intent on forcing Christians and other people? You know, it's too bad they're not Muslims. Why are they so intent on forcing them? Because this is not about live and let live. This is not about tolerance. This is, unless you see it our way, we will hurt you. I notice that the people who deep in their hearts know what they're doing is wrong can't stand that somebody else doesn't agree with them. And so they have to do everything they can in their power to try and force people to do what their convictions or God tells them they can't do. Look, man, if I'm getting married, if you don't agree with my wedding, then fine. I'll find somebody else. There's plenty of other people who'll do it. These people are fined $135,000. So far, 
There's an organization that uh, it used to be GoFundMe, but they shut them down. I just read that as of yesterday, uh, people have given them, through another organization, $372,000. So. But of course, that's, uh, that's not enough because they don't really have a business anymore and they have kids. So you need to pray for them and see what happens with this case in Oregon. Uh, check this out. Do you know that a, uh, a, a Christian consultant was fired by Bank of America over a gay marriage book? Just months after being fired from Cisco Systems in California over an anti-gay marriage book, Christian consultant... Who the heck is that? <laughs> yeah, that's me. I wrote that book, uh, Correct Not Politically Correct, How Same-Sex Marriage Hurts Everyone. I don't have time to tell you the whole story here. But the point here is, is that I was fired because I had written a book that had nothing to do with what I was doing for Cisco or Bank of America. But they fired me because the people who say they're fighting for tolerance are often the most intolerant people out there. In fact, I had a conversation with the uh, head of inclusion and diversity at Cisco. Her name is Marilyn Nagel. And she just quite couldn't figure out how in the name of inclusion and diversity that it was wrong to exclude me. For having a diverse view. Just couldn't quite figure that out. <laughs> so that book's available back on the book table as well. And there's a couple of columns. In fact, uh, there's some columns that I've written and my friend Mike Adams has written on this topic. They're on townhall.com. And if you go to townhall.com and click on my name, Frank Turek, you'll see a column called Sex at Work. Read that column. It explains what happened. By the way, do not put that in Google. Sex at work. Okay? Just want you to be aware of that. Go to townhall.com, click on my name, then look for it. It's from 2011. And also read the column by Mike Adams called The Cisco Kid. Okay? Because uh, I actually wrote a letter to John Chambers, who's the head of Cisco. And there's a lot of great people in Cisco, by the way, when my friends works there. I'm not saying this is true of the whole company, but John Chambers, who was on the elect McCain Commission in 2008. He was the uh, CEO at, at Cisco at the time. When, when they fired me, I, I wrote John Chambers and I said, uh, uh, Mr. Chambers, I'm a veteran of the United States Navy. Thank you for your support of Senator John McCain in the last election. Are you aware that Senator McCain holds the same position on same-sex marriage that I do? Are you qualified to be working at Cisco? <laughs> so that's how the whole thing started. But anyway, you can read about it online. Uh, by the way, if we don't stand for religious freedom, who will? Because <laughs> Pastor Jack one day is not going to be able to preach here anymore. Not because he's going to get old. Well, he will get old. <laughs> Pastor Jack's, you know, 57. Did he tell you that? He does not look a day over 56. In, in my opinion. Actually, he, he does look really good, doesn't he? He's a young kid. He's just a young kid. I'm kind of a young too. You know, I, I, I'm 53. When I turned 50, my wife was real encouraging. She said, honey, you're going to live to be 100. I said, how do you know? She said, because you look half dead already. <laughs> I said, thanks a lot. That's very encouraging. No, one day, unless you are involved politically, they're going to come to that door right there and shut it. Because he's a bigot, a homophobe, and he can't preach the gospel anymore. Oh, politics doesn't affect... I'm, I just preach the word. You can't preach the word without political freedom. Not legally. Who's going to... Of course it's a good point. <laughs> What's the problem with this... I get one good point a presentation now. That's it. If we don't protect life, who will? It's time for the reborn to protect the unborn. Don't you think? All right. And if we don't protect children, because that's really what marriage is about, then who will? If we don't do it, who's going to do it? Good point. <laughs> Two good points. 
All right, so finally, what is the question that you can do? Now, we can get real ornery about the president and, and other presidents, and gee, these guys are really bad, and yeah, you can make a case that they haven't governed rightly. I understand that. Um, but who do we really blame? Yeah, you got a problem? Blame the church. We're the, we're the problem because we have not been salt and light enough. We are the problem. Yeah, you can say the, go the, the governments, you know, but we, we get the governments we deserve. We put those people in there. We're the problem. Now, what about the pastors? Those pastors who say, look, I just preached the word. Or I've actually had pastors say, oh, we can't, we, we can't go down this road. We, we don't, can't risk our tax-exempt status. Last time I checked the Bible, it didn't say anything about being tax-exempt. You're not called to be tax-exempt. You're called to be salt and light. If you lose tax-exempt status, so be it. In fact, no ch church has ever lost its tax-exempt status because you can do a lot. In fact, you know, the ADF, the Alliance Defending Freedom, is actually sending sermons to the IRS where pastors are getting up and saying, vote for this guy. Don't vote for this guy. And the IRS won't touch it. Why? Because they know if it ever goes to court, they'll probably lose. They'd rather leave sleeping dogs lie. Pastors can say just about anything they want and not lose tax-exempt status. And if we do lose tax-exempt status, that might ultimately be a good thing. Why? Because it'll take all the shackles off us and we'll just, everyone will just go, well, forget it. I'm just going to speak the truth then. You ought to speak the truth anyway. So. And by the way, in our culture, you are Caesar. So which kind of country are you trying to create? You want something more like South Korea or North Korea? South. Yeah, hopefully South, but it's up to you. It's up to me. All right, as Lincoln said, the philosophy of the schoolroom in one generation will be the philosophy of the government in the next. We gave up the government, or we gave up uh, the schoolroom, we gave up media, we gave up law, we gave up all these things just to preach the gospel, and all the godly influence came out of the culture, and then we wonder why the culture's gone godless. Yeah. We're the problem. So we can go home and look in the mirror. As Edmund Burke famously said, the only thing necessary for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. All right, so you want to do something good? If not, you who? Here are some resources, some books that will help you do something. Legislating morality is really what we talked about here. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about correct, not politically correct, how same-sex marriage hurts everything, everyone. And then the new book, Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. Uh, that goes into this in pretty good detail as well in the morality chapter. Don't forget to put that particular... Uh, thing in your browser there, crossexamine.org forward slash summit. If you're not a reader, you'd rather watch than the Legislating Morality DVD set, which is actually longer than what we just did here in 45 minutes, is back on the table. It's actually in the gym. And then tomorrow's presentation, the four P's and the four, uh, four Q's, the case for natural marriage and against same-sex marriage is a one-hour video on, on the topic of same-sex marriage. So you can check that out as well. All right, and then don't forget the TV and the radio that we talked about last time. And I also mentioned the app. How many have downloaded the app? Have you downloaded the app yet? Download it. It's free. Did I mention that? Free. All right, and then finally, there's some other resources or other organizations out there that are doing good work online. Alliance Defending Freedom. If you don't know about them, just get their alert. That will help you see what's going on so you can be involved. Also, nationformarriage.org. These are all nonprofit organizations that are doing good work out there. Of course, frc.org. That's Tony Perkins and Gil, who works a lot with Tony Perkins and company. Uh, he is involved there. frc.org. You've got to know about them. afa.net, the American Family Association. That's, they actually carry our radio program. And if you get an AFA alert, those guys are amazing. If somebody burps in Washington, you're going to get... An email 10 minutes later. Who burped? How long did they burp? How, what did the burp smell like? How to prevent future burps? You need to know what's going on. They're dialed in. Also, liveaction.org. This is the organization that has done some of those sting videos on Planned Parenthood. Not the most recent one, but other ones. It's led by Lila Rose. She's a graduate of UCLA. Young gal who is very pro-life. So check out that organization as well. So summary. Should Christians be involved in politics? Yes. Can we legislate morality? Yes. What are the stakes? Everything. What can you do? A lot. Get busy. See ya.